So uh, each year, uh, we try to get um, a patient perspective on this world. Um, and our um, patient perspective speaker this year has uh, an incredible story. Um, and it's not just a story about herself, it's about her entire family um, and how you integrate lifestyle into, into family. And being a dad of a one-year-old, it's very poignant for me. I was a, um, a, dad, a new dad last year, and over this past year, it's been an incredible experience, kind of, you know, having a... <laughs> um, raise, starting to raise my own family, and you come to realise just how important family is. Um, so please welcome Claire McDonald. So, hello, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here to talk. Thank you, Sam. I'm really humbled by being able to share our story with you all and what a lovely, lovely conference has been. So, so warm and friendly. So, I introduce our family. Um, this, uh, this is us on holiday last year. This is my husband, Justin. He's, he's here today. Hey. hey. <laughs> Um, my son Rudy's uh, about to turn eight, and that's my daughter Leafy in an action shot. She's age six. This is us in Florida doing the whole Disney World thing last autumn, and we had a really, really wonderful experience. Um, roller coasters, meeting Minnie Mouse, the whole works. And uh, it's really very much a holiday. I do feel we wouldn't have been able to go on at all or experience the level we, of enjoyment we did if we hadn't have learned about real foods and um, changing our, our diets. So I'll explain a little bit. That's, um, that's uh, Rudy, and uh, he won't thank me for putting that photo up, and it's not a good one. But Rudy um, was always healthy, robust, strong, bounced back from any little cough or cold. Um, he was really good, but he did have skin problems. So he had um, cradle cap, um, which lots of babies do, um, but his stayed and uh, eventually it kind of grew down his forehead to, to his nose. Um, when we started him on solids, he... Um, uh, around six months, he started developing little red patches after eating where he'd come into contact with food. It didn't seem to us to be a specific food that we could pin down, um, but he was reacting. And then he started getting little bubbles on his um, chest and on his tummy. Um, uh, I call them welds. So he went, we went to the doctors and we got that checked out. They all disappeared within 10, 20 minutes. There was no other symptoms, so he wasn't having loads of problems with it, but it, there was something going on. Uh, he was, um, develop he was uh, diagnosed with urticaria for, for that, those little bubbles. Um, and then uh, he was diagnosed with eczema because his skin started becoming dry and patchy and started having eczema symptoms. Um, and then he also, um, poor thing, started having hair falling out in clumps. So he um, was diagnosed with alopecia areata where s sections of your hair fall out and um, le leaving a bold uh, patch behind shiny scalp. Um, so the impact on him um, was itchy, raw skin mainly. That was his main problem, concern. Uh, it was making him cry. It was making him itch all of the time. And the same raw patches of skin. And this is probably familiar to lots of people. Eczema is not so uncommon. But I hadn't thought about it myself in any detail when anyone had said they had eczema, how difficult it can make family life. And, uh, and how difficult it can be to experience it. So at night times, I'd be putting plasters on his fingers, um, putting bandages on the really raw patches to try to kind of get, get him um, some protection, buying him silk mittens to put on at bedtime. And he was waking up every night and struggling to go to sleep, and, and we were doing what we could. Uh, I was very concerned about the alopecia, not come across it before myself, not for a child anyway. And we were healthy, we were having a good diet. Oh, I didn't know where this was coming from. Um, we went to um, we, checked, we went to the doctors and we went to regular appointments, went to the hospitals, and each of these things were looked at separately. And um, we were given the creams and the emollients. We tried all of those, and eventually we ended up using the steroid creams, and they cleared up the eczema beautifully, usually. But it always came back much, much worse. So I dreaded using those. Um, and I was aware that we were treating the symptoms, so I was asking the doctors. We changed hospitals for a second opinion. I was asking the doctors to look at this as, as a cluster of symptoms and look at the root cause, what's going on underneath, not just topically. 
and I had a frank conversation with a doctor and I, I do appreciate those and I, I thought it was good. He, he told me that he, um, we wouldn't be investigating, they wouldn't be able to, but he would you know, keep helping with creams until we found a cream that offered a bit of relief, but not going to be looking into the underlying cause. So not, they're not the best picks. I was looking through the family album. And uh, so you can see a little bit on his finger, urticaria he's got there. And that has come out from not from food, but he just touched gently the, the gate in the back garden. So he was reacting to mould spores as well. He's dug into his back. I don't know if you can see, it's not, not the best picks, but where he's got kind of claw marks and red patches. And there, can you see, he's got a patch of hair growing back where he's got bold, bold piece of hair, bless him. Um, so here, um, this is a, a follow-up picture um, taken three months apart from, from this first one where he was, his skin was quite poorly. Um, so we, we looked into underlying causes and, and what could be treatments and we found the Western A. Price um, Foundation and their information I think is amazing and um, the GAPS diet and that really inspired us to, to come up with our, our diet and we put him on... Um, what I would now call, now I know, um, a low carbohydrate diet. I stopped making those sweet date treats of homemade chocolates, which tasted quite nice, that I thought was doing him a favour um, because it, I cut out the sugar. So I, st I stopped with them um, with those. Uh, and he was having bone broths and um, stews regularly, um, good quality meats, grass fed butter. We changed, we changed to a more traditional diet and, and quite, quite restrictive. And that's, that was the result. He was a happy boy. He had lovely skin, and, and the, the difference started quite quickly, actually. Within, within weeks, we were noticing he was having less flare-ups, and he was, he was itching less, so I was not having to chase him around, telling him not to itch, like that was helping him anyway. But he, his skin recovered really nicely. Uh, so what we learned from our experience there was that food is absolutely awesome and shouldn't be underestimated and is unfortunately with the NHS und undervalued and, and not taken into consideration even after we kind of brought these experiences back to our doctors um, it, it's, um, it wasn't, they weren't able to take that uh, kind of information or learning on board um, but we've learnt the value of food and we were absolutely delighted and we were, we were living a, a very happy family life again and we learned that there are social changes, and I've been hearing about that this weekend, and, and we live it. So we are the healthy family living on a, a healthier diet, and food, uh, refined food and sugars are absolutely everywhere, at every step of our family life. It's every shop we go into, every time I pick the children up from school, and every sports club we go, go to, it's absolutely unavoidable. Um, but... So, so we're, we're eating differently, but we've noticed, we noticed very quickly our tastes adapted and we enjoyed these new foods that were nourishing us and we felt well on them. So um, this is Leafy, she was born uh, around this time. She was, she was, um, uh, there was uh, we had two under two, so um, we were busy and feeling pretty lucky and loving it, loving family life. Uh, I had a healthy pregnancy, um, that all went really, really well and she was a lovely happy baby and she had no, none of the health problems or skin problems that Rudy had had, had. Um, but um, around around six months old she'd just turned six months uh, and we'd started her on solid food that week actually she i woke up one night to a strange um, noise uh, in the bedroom so i went over and checked on her and she was uh, making a repetitive movements with her with her limbs and her eyes were fixed she, she had saliva coming out of her mouth, she was a funny colour, uh, and she couldn't respond when I picked her up uh, or called her name. So we called an ambulance, and the ambulance came in four minutes, they were absolutely amazing, and they looked after her. They um, took her and me to hospital, local hospital, and she was assessed, she was checked, and she was given a recovery uh, rescue medication to stop what we were told is likely to be a febrile seizure. So um, the seizure had lasted around 30, 35 minutes. It had been prolonged. Um, she, was, she was looked after and then and assessed. And they found a, a, a childhood, minor childhood in something like a, an ear infection. I can't quite remember what it was now. But that had caused her temperature to go up. The first we knew she had any health um, issue at that time was, was that that caused her to go into a seizure. And we were told about those. It's not that uncommon children grow out of it, these things happen. So 
off we went. She recovered brilliantly. She bounced back. She recovered from the medication. She recovered from the, the ex um, exhaustion of the, the seizures and the night in the hospital. And off we went again. So um, startled, worried, concerned about it, but feeling pretty confident that that would be behind us. But then a few weeks later, um, I was putting her in the bath and she, she went into another of these, what we now knew were, was a febrile seizure. So again, it was the same pattern. So her, her limbs were clenching and releasing, her eyes were fixed, she was having a bit of difficulty with her breathing and she couldn't respond. So uh, again, an ambulance came and took her to a hospital and me. And we stayed there this time. We stayed there six days, um, six long days. And uh, it, it's, she, she had lots of tests and assessments and observations and she was looked after. She had a um, lumbar puncture as a precaution, an I, IV drip as a precaution. She had a EEG attached to her scalp, so um, looking for uh, epileptic activity, brain activity. So they glued the um, probes onto her scalp and observed her brain waves, um, which came back without anything. Um, she went for an MRI scan while she was in, an inpatient, and that was really traumatic. I mean, it was all pretty daunting, scary, terrifying, but that, I think, topped it really watching her go under. She came back um, from that and we were discharged and we were so relieved to get out of hospital. Um, it's hot in there, all of the assessments and, and get back to normal life. And again, we were told this, you know, to the best of the doctor's knowledge, this was febrile seizures. She had had a childhood illness. Again, it was a gastro one this time. And again, it was minor. And the first we'd known of it was this, um, uh, this seizure. So this um, happened again. Um, a few weeks later, and again, she was ambulanced in and stayed a couple of nights, observations, tests, checks, and released. And then again, and then again, and then again. So it almost became three weekly that we seemed to be going into hospital with her in an ambulance, blue lights. The complicating factors in her febrile seizures were, I mean, she was under one, so she's a baby dealing with all of this, and they were not stopping. They um, needed recovery medication to stop them, so diazepam or midazolam so quite a strong medication and they were lasting around 30 minutes typically so something generally in between 25 and 35 minutes a lot of exertion for her um, it was you know it was a hellish time for us um, when, which should have been a lovely you know time with the, our young family but in between she recovered well she bounced back after she'd got over it and her health was remarkably good otherwise so yeah we were in the middle of all of this and we unfortunately she 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 did it did deteriorate because they started coming more frequently the seizures and um they became other seizure types uh, and I've, and uh um they were they were more often they were too often um she was also we noticed she was having episodes of um, wobbliness, ataxia, I think it's called, where I noticed that she'd lost all coordination and it looked really, it only lasted seconds, but it looked super frightening. It looked like videos I'd seen of mad cow disease where they lost all coordination and muscle function, only for a few seconds, but terrifying. She had episodes where, I've put behaviour here, but episodes where she was distressed and crying and she couldn't be touched and we couldn't comfort her and she wouldn't have anything touch her. And that could go on 45 minutes or an hour in sheer distress. Um, her sleep uh, was absolutely atrocious. So she would take four hours every single night to go to sleep and she would wake at the slightest sound, um, uh, any, any little noise. And she, would, uh, she went through a stage of, of waking every hour. So, so naps were impossible and her night sleep was was terrible and that wasn't doing anything for her quality of life and her, her overall health. Um, so our quality of life and our sleep and our young family life and looking after our son and trying to manage work and life and normal life in between, it was all spiralling really badly out of control. And we felt lonely and isolated. I mean, thank goodness for communities online because we were, I didn't feel with two young children like going to the mum groups very much. Uh, in case we had a seizure and um, and we were generally suffering the after effects of a seizure as well. So we were becoming increasingly isolated as a family. 
And I was reading, my bedtime reading was things like SUDEP, so sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. I didn't know it was a thing. You could pass away unexpectedly. Um, so that was what I was going to bed reading and all about disorders and epilepsy syndromes and what, what triggers there were. Uh, so that was, I even remember looking up, I don't know why, um, but looking up what you... Um, what the criteria was to be a pilot and she hadn't expressed an interest in being a pilot <laughs> but <laughs> my head was thinking she had this golden open horizon and I was this seeing how it was being narrowed and what was going to become of her and what what you know what what she wouldn't she be able to do and what what might happen with all of this that was going on something was not going right at all and she still had the diagnosis of complex febrile convulsions so every single one of these seizures had been linked with a spike in temperature um, and we were still very much hoping that she would grow out of all of this. So she had not been diagnosed with epilepsy, but we were told on each visit um, that the protocol for if she does have a non-febrile seizure would be then she would be classed as having epilepsy, maybe a specific epilepsy, maybe generalised, and then she would need a, a tr treatment, she needs therapy to stop that. And we very much wanted to stop these seizures because we're reading about brain damage and, and all sorts of things, it, the impact it's having on her and us. So um, we, we found out about AEDs and anti-epileptic drugs and the, uh, our team told us the first one they were likely to prescribe in that situation. So, but on our nightly reads of hours and hours and hours of reading, we also found the ketogenic diet. And um, I found it by reading a blog of a family who were based in Canada um, and they were treating their daughter with a diet that I hadn't heard of before, and she was drinking a pot of olive oil, and she was taking that pot of olive oil to school with her. Um, and every time she had a drink, um, a snack or a meal, she would be drinking this. So we researched it, Justin and I, looked into it in detail, and we found that it um, has consistently good results, this diet, at treating different seizure conditions and different disorders. So it's consistent, it's evidence-based, um, loads of great studies on it, uh, with different age range and different um, conditions and um, yeah and consistent results good efficacy with different types of epilepsy so and we found out it was NHS supported as well and there's clinics dotted around England and then we found out it was a clinic in our own hospital but we hadn't been told this so 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 we then we then asked our team about this diet and we asked our friends who were doctors and dietitians and we asked people we'd made contact with, and we got the same answer about the ketogenic diet, avoid it, because it's unsustainable. You can't get a child to eat in that kind of way. The foods are awful. They're unpalatable, awful, full of cream, um, absolutely dosing and dosing with fats, and it is for intractable epilepsy, for those rare seizure conditions, and those people, who unfortunately, have not been able to be managed on drugs. So what we would be doing is um, we would be trying a, a low dose of a drug with her and then going up higher, higher, higher until we had seizure management or we would be adding multiple drugs in, uh, in uh, weaning some, adding them, doing combinations and that's how uh, epilepsy is managed. But for those rare cases that that does not work for, then you can be considered to go on the waiting list for under-resourced ketogenic diet therapy. So we looked at this, now I, have, uh, I might use my zapper now. So we looked at the side effects because that's what we've been told about ketoacidosis, um, limiting your, um, your uh, growth potential. We, I found that so vomiting, diarrhea, pancreatitis, drowsiness, osteopenia, uh, an increased risk of fractures, I think that's the same. Um, it's, it's, they also appear in the medication that, that she was likely to go on. So looking at those, that list, and this was the medication she was going to go on, they, they, looked, they looked like more for a start. Um, and, uh, and there were things you know, that would worry any parent, um, as with, with lots of medications, but memory impairment stood out. Um, I mean, birth defects, male infertility, it's been in the news recently for, for that. Um, hallucinations, um, bone marrow failure, dementia, behavioral disturbance, suicidal thoughts. Uh, Blah blah blah. So, um, uh, or in risk of uh, ataxia, that's the wobbliness and convulsions. So, uh, they seem less uh, with the ketogenic diet. They work. They are less, and they can be avoided or alleviated, as um, say, um, a Great Ormond Street Hospital. So, 
by managing the diet, by manipulating it. So that was really interesting to us. Um, as a parent, we were majorly focused on this learning disorders. We've got a one-year-old to a two-year-old at this point looking um, when we were researching this, and that's like absolute fundamental time in her cognitive development and all of her development. So that's, um, if we can avoid that uh, and try something else, that seems more sen makes more sense to us. As well as that, the ketogenic, oh, sorry. The ketogenic diet has um, behavioural and cognitive advantages, uh, whereas AEDs work in the opposite way, dampening uh, neural activity. So may have the opposite effect. So she had a checkup around her just before her second birthday, and she was found to have a non-febrile um, seizure. So she was diagnosed with generalised epilepsy. So the diagnosis changed. She needed a therapy. Uh, so we, um, my husband and I, we started her straight away. We'd been getting ready, doing our research, and we started her knowing we wouldn't get the support. We, we started her ourselves on the modified version of the ketogenic diet, and I've put real foods to emphasise that it's, it, it's um, we, yeah, we use real foods very much, what we've been talking about um, over the conference. Um, so I don't need to explain, I'm sure, high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet, and it's changing where uh, ketogenic diets are changing the way your body's fueling from glucose, switching over to using ketones that you're getting from your, your fat sources. We put her on a two to one ratio. That's why it's modified. But, um, uh, rather than what was being used typically at that time, a classic ketogenic diet, which would be a ratio more like four to one uh, or 3.5 to one. So, so that was two portions of fat for every one portion of protein and carbohydrate that we were giving her for every single meal and every snack, and her limit, 10 grams of carbs per day. That was her max limit. <coughs> the advantages of us going um, for the modified version, I mean, it was more manageable for us as parents, as a family. Um, there was less fat, so that's where she doesn't have to drink the <coughs> pots of olive oil and, and drown her, her foods in, in um, creams. Uh, and important for us, there was no liquid or portion restrictions, as, as there is with some um, uh, some classic ketogenic diets. She had, so therefore, she could have a wider um, food variety um, with an R emphasis was on real foods and getting good nutrients uh, into her both through the carbohydrates and through the fats. And that therefore lowered the risk of side effects. <coughs> so what's out? I mean, you guys know this, don't you? So um, we've, we've opted for a real foods diet, but you can do ketogenic diet, as you can do lots of diets in different ways. You, you know, we do know people who do it in very different ways, and they, they get results for managing their epilepsy. But for us, it was a real foods diet, so we opted not to have any cereals or pastas or rice or breads, you know, the, the key refined bits and pieces. <laughs> I think initially I was surprised how many carbs um, were in milk and fruits, um, although we were reasonably... We weren't overdoing it on fruits. It was um, we had to be very restrictive. Uh, this is a, a photo that we took on a flight um, last year. It was a diabetic meal we ordered for her to um, see if there was anything in that she could eat, and there wasn't. There, there it is. Uh, and this is the kind of food, the kind of food I think you're all maybe eating. So omelets, loads of eggs, homemade bread. We've just got into bread. We've not really missed it, but we've got back into baking bread out of seed or not flowers and uh, and then this is her fave in the middle she has that every morning she's got a little tray with lots of different seeds and nuts and she gets her natural yogurt and she makes that up herself with them um, and we sneak extra chia seeds into her nut butters but don't tell her <laughs> <laughs> oh i just put here I, I thought i'd forget we uh, emphasis on organic traditional foods and fermented and and, and getting fiber really key, really interested in her overall or health, not just ketosis, microbiome, gut health, uh, overall support. And so that's, that's not a bad, pack, bad packed lunch. I work in schools. I've worked um, uh, in hundreds of different schools, supporting them to improve school food. And I don't see many, well, I don't see any that look like that. So that's not, she's not doing, and that's one of her absolute favorite meals, the um, bolognese. So we make, um, uh, our treats from now make homemade chocolate differently and make um, ice cream. We're big into um, frozen yogurt at the moment, and the kids are, and we make birthday cakes and we use the nut flowers and seed flowers and we use um, mainly fruit to sweeten them distributed um, amongst the recipe. Uh, so it doesn't, definitely doesn't taste as sweet and that's verified any time a child comes to my house and tries one of my cakes. 
Uh, it's not quite what they're expecting. It looks the part, but it's not got the hit, but we love it. Our, our palette has definitely changed. It's got no additives, no refined, um, and we don't use artificial sweetness. Challenges, uh, yeah, so uh, I have to say, it, is cha it was challenging at the beginning especially. Uh, it was a steep learning curve for us, um, even coming from doing a, a really restrictive diet with Rudy in the past, uh, learning about carbs and we were weighing and measuring and we were logging and we were tracking everything. Uh, so that was hard and we were often cooking until two in the morning or early hours um, trying to get these recipes right and we were up against it time-wise when we started because we were in Australia um, where we were at that time and we were coming back to England in days time so we needed foods that were good for travelling um, and you can tell how new we were to the whole um, ketchup and diet recipe making because we decided uh, a good look for the flight for 26 hours of travel would be a frittata of egg, cauliflower and tuna. <laughs> By the time we got to Perth Airport it was already <laughs> a grey sopping mess. So yeah, that wasn't the best look but we, we, we managed. Uh, so social occasions, um, it was very difficult at the beginning. I, I was quite anxious at birthday parties or outings, I was following her around, I was suddenly a helicopter <coughs> parent in case she touched a bit of icing or somebody handed her a sweet. Um, but, and on eating out, we didn't eat out because we were weighing and measuring and we were getting our confidence up with it. Um, but I have to say that um, because I, I'm being honest that there are challenges and it is difficult and sugar is absolutely everywhere um, and being in a different family, eating differently, uh, is it can be tricky, but it's easier than manage health problems and definitely easier than sitting in a room with her recovering from a seizure when she should be playing outside and I can hear other children playing on a summer's day outside. So that's the absolute pits. Um, so cooking until midnight is not too much of a problem and that's only in the beginning until you've got your repertoire and it becomes, you know, second nature as it has done for us now. So... Um, um, my tip to other families, my absolute top tip for any diet change, you know, maybe not keto, but, but any diet change moving on to real foods or anything, is to make um, home that environment that, uh, where they're, they're safe. Because every time they go out, every time they go to school, every time they go to a friend's house, um, every time they go to shop, they're surrounded by things. Um, so, so, they sh so if you can avoid temptation and eat together and eat the same foods and enjoy them and speak positively about them, that's an absolute, that's a winner. You're going to kind of get that compliance that we were told we wouldn't get. You're going to get that confidence and, and that enjoyment of, of food as well. We frame this really positively with our daughter. Um, we call it her amazing diet. So she calls it her amazing diet. So if, you, if you've got a cough, you're poorly, you've got a sniffle, she'll come up to you and tell you that you should be doing her amazing diet. <laughs> and I, I don't think she's too far wrong, actually. So here she is quite the different picture um, and these are the benefits for for her and therefore for us as parents um, absolutely amazing seizure reduction so she took to these foods apart from a certain frittata she really nicely and she enjoyed them and she was absolutely fine she'd never really been into carbs that much anyway so um, and within days she was producing ketones and we say she's rock solid uh, in ketosis because she always produces consistent ketones. We have been really flexible with her diet and she still produces them. But within, so within say day three she started producing ketones. She was having 60 myoclonic clusters of seizures a day at that point. They like, they last about two seconds, maybe three, four seconds, but she has clusters of them and they make her hands go up in the air and her eyes roll in a quite disturbing way and stopped her, stopped her speaking. And other children were remarking on that in the playground and that was kind of causing me, you know, a little bit of distress. And she was, that was really affecting her. They, they went on day three and they've never come back. So that in itself was awesome. So her main seizure type was her tonic clonics. So weeks before we started the keto diet, she'd had uh, the major seizures, um, seizure and it had lasted 45 minutes or more. Um, we'd been ambulance to Perth Airport. Um, the medication we carry didn't stop it. The medication the paramedics gave her didn't stop it. Uh, and we found ourselves on a hospital ward in, in Perth. Uh, and it lasted 45 minutes. Uh, and she 
her seizures of those, those major ones, they started reducing in um, how often they were. They became, they were twice a week approximately. Um, they became weekly, fortnightly, monthly, and then major like long um, spells apart. So she has really good um, um, seizure-free periods. Uh, and they became, from, from 45 minutes or averaging around 20, 30 minutes, they became 10 minutes, then eight minutes, then five minutes, and now the longest would be two. And that means she doesn't have to have that um, recovery medication to stop those seizures. So they became self-resolving. And all really quickly, these, these results started kicking in. Her sleep improved. The first thing we noticed was it was deeper. Uh, so she was, so that was really good for her overall health. And, um, and then she started settling easier and incrementally that improved and improved. She didn't have any more of the screaming or the wobbly um, episodes. Everything seemed to level out um, for her. Um, developmentally, she's on track. That's absolutely super important for us. It was what, what you know, one thing we were, well, we wanted seizure control and we wanted um, to protect her cognitively um, from the potential brain damage that could be caused from uh, a seizure from the dampening effect of medication. And because of some of the seizure disorders I was reading about and I was concerned about, um, are linked to development delays and in fact later on she was she was diagnosed with that um, a specific genetic uh, epilepsy that um, is, is linked to um, development delays cognitive um, uh, losses in between age two and six where you might lose your speech uh, um, the skills you've learned um, uh, walking so fortunately she has found the right therapy on the right therapy at the right time um, for her and uh, ha is having all of these amazing um, advantages of them. Um, she's meeting her vitamin and mineral levels and nutrient levels. Every time we're, we're in clinic, we get her bloods tested. Um, she's, um, she's hitting all of those, and they often remark. Uh, and that's without NHS fruity bits, so that's all good. Um, and like I say, she's extremely proud of her diet, and she talks openly, positively, and confidently, which is really, really important for her and no no ambulance trips no hospital stays no no stays on ward uh since so that's that's um that's good <laughs> so that's our family we've managed two chronic health conditions um, and using foods using very different diets but also with some uh some um similarities the common factors being that they were low carb we've absolutely made it a focus that it's real foods and we've embraced good fats and we're very, very pro-fat. There's a, a picture of a, a fat that we've been making. We, we embraced tallow uh, and saturated fats. So uh, early on when that was with Rudy's diet. So, um, and, that, and now we've become, as, as probably lots of you in this room are, really, really focused on food, really aware of, of um, the wrong information that's coming at families like us. Uh, so we're determined um, to help other, other families as much as we, we can. So we've set up our, um, our own little grassroots organisation in the last few months. Um, and this is, this, we want to be a resource um, for other families to give them a little bit of hope and positivity because one thing I did notice when I was researching is it all felt extremely negative and everything we heard about diet was negative and we didn't hear much of the good stuff on what can be achieved. So we feel like we were lacking a resource and we'd like to... to um, bring that, make it available. So we've been interviewing other people because it's not just about <coughs> us and what we've been up to. We've been interviewing other people um, about their own real food journeys and how that's impacted on their children, their family life and, and improved their own health and their, their children's health. So these people have been kind enough to meet with us and um, get their stories out there to, to help others. And um, we've got Russell talking about cervical cancer and diet and uh, Gemma talking about rehabilitating her son with um, a foundation of foods after a brain tumour left him without speech. Um, and then Hashimoto's um, with Lisa and uh, Dr Sarah Ballantyne sharing her story of, um, of uh, how she's managed to manage her weight and her autoimmune problems. So that's the type of thing we're up to and um, I've been uh, asked to, to give a, a few talks and kindly Matthew's friends have asked me to share my, my story with them at the Keto College. Um, last, last year, um, they have an amazing Ketchenik diet uh, charity, really, really pushing 
um, for ketogenic diet to be made much more widely available. I know involved with training um, staff, uh, training dietitians, and, and making, making things really happen. So, uh, yes, and we also did an interview we're locally, uh, and our story was in the local newspaper, uh, and then it got picked up by all the good publications. Uh, <laughs> and, and they went with the story that, um, that she'd almost been cured of epilepsy. I'm not a fan of the word cured at all. Uh, and they also went with a, a massive skew that it, was, it seemed to be an avocado diet more than a ketchup diet. But, but I guess the point has got across somewhere to someone, hopefully, that um, there, is, there is another option. It, it isn't just the medication that you're being shown. That's, um, that was our hope. Um, and we're, we're putting together a, a sugar-free uh, course. It's free. This is a not-for-profit. It's all because we want to help spread the word and do, do what we can uh, in, in whatever way we can. So... So we're, we're, it's due to be released in June, and it's just to, this is what we're asked mostly, and not have to do keto, because if I'm asked that, I would, I would refer to Matthew's friends. And, um, but we're asked how, how families can get started on reducing their sugars in their diet, and they know they need to make a change, but they just don't know how, and they don't know what, and they're busy, and they haven't got time to look into it. So this is really our family favourite recipes, and how, how to get started on, on reducing sugar. Uh, and we've also been asked recently to work in a local school, a special education needs school, working with um, pupils. They all, it's, a really, it's a small independent school, um, they have several schools, uh, and the pupils have autism, and some of them have, or a lot of them have, highly uber-processed um, foods on a daily basis, uh, KFC, takeaways, um, really repetitive, and then they have, lots of them have food issues where they won't eat in front of people, and they've got processing issues with food. So we're, we're trying to kind of work support them. Two of the pupils agreed to work with us for a whole week. Um, and they, they took up our, our food challenge and, and, and ate real foods. They, they put away their sugary um, tea, their cartons of orange juice and their takeaways and their double pack of custard cream that they would have as a snack throughout the day. Uh, and they ate actual just food, really. Uh, and this is the kind of food we were serving, burgers, lamb burgers, and we, we packed them off with dinner and snacks as well. I've got a movie that we can, we can play. Hello, we're here at uh, the Woodside Lodge Outdoor Learning Committee in Leicestershire. It is a special education school, and they have asked us to come along to work with their pupils this week. Um, we are going to be cooking all of their meals and their snacks and they've agreed not to eat their typical foods um, which is typically things like biscuits and cereals and white bread uh, and we're going to see if that makes a difference to the pupils to their um, AC type symptoms and uh, we'll be monitoring them and assessing them and uh, they're really really lovely, we've met them, they're really excited to get started so uh, we're looking forward to working with them. So we visited some of our local organic farm shops to pick up some veggies and meat and we cooked everything from scratch for the kids for five days. For breakfast we did things like bacon and eggs and sausages and waffles. For lunch we did salmon with vegetables and burgers and salads. And for dinner we did things like cottage pie and bolognese. So menu-wise we didn't go mad but the quality of all the ingredients was second to none and we did manage to throw in something every day that we'd never had before, just to keep it interesting. They find it really difficult to adapt to change, but they've, they've been absolutely fantastic. I think it, it's more important because they actually enjoy the food that they're eating. Some of them, you know, a sandwich, mm. a packet of crisps, mm. a drink, and then a chocolate bar or something. Right. It'll sandwich. be a sweet drink. And it will be a sweet drink. Yeah. Um, it will be a chocolate, you know, Mars bar or something. Yeah. Um, some of them bring in like Pringles and mm. go through the whole tin. Yeah. Um, some of them bring a packet of biscuits and stuff and go through the whole packet. Um, but we've noticed a lot of difference with uh, some gangs and things back in the day. In the morning, nine o'clock in the morning, half past nine in the morning. Normally, James is quite tired at that sort of time and he was eating. Well, he was dancing. He was dancing while he was doing it. It was amazing. So, and I was watching from the outside. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, can I just say yes. a thank you as well? Because, sorry, I know it's not an award show or anything, but um, this, it has felt really lonely, being a foodie, being into real foods, and here it feels like I'm surrounded by people who get it and get the importance of it. And not only that, but you're all making such a difference and you're all trying to do your bit. So that's really special because it means that families like mine will be looked after and, and get the right information that they need. And a huge thank you to Sam for, for all of this. Excellent. So, any questions from the audience? We've got time for a couple. <laughs> uh, have any of the clinics that, or the people at the clinic that were trying to persuade you to put her on the drugs acknowledged that you actually made the right decision? Um, that's a good question. Um, we, I, um, Matthew's friends asked me if I could give a talk at a neuro neurological clinic, Grand Round, and my former neurologist and current were there, and they both congratulated us for what we've achieved, and they've been extremely positive. That said, um, we, we're not meeting um, the protocol because of the way we're applying the diet um, at a low ratio and because our daughter's been in sustained ketosis for, for four years, um, we're, it's, we're, not, we're not doing what we should be doing in terms of NHS protocol and that's become quite <coughs> difficult. So, so, so yes, but no, we're, nothing's changed. <laughs> So they, they wouldn't recommend uh, or refer another family to talk to you before no. they put them on drugs? No, um, I don't think they would. They would um, if they were assessed to be um, suitable for ketogenic diet under the current NICE guidelines. So, our, I mean, I say about our team and our support, we've had amazing support. And if we need emergency care and if we need the drugs in the future, we've got that back up. And they're their supporters. They're, they're, they're wonderful. And they're dealing with the most poorly children. Um, the ones who've got intractable epilepsy, the, the ones that haven't been, uh, nothing has been able to help. So they've got it, they've got it tough. But no, they wouldn't be doing anything outside the NICE guidelines, which is that children should be um, only considered for ketogenic diet under very specific circumstances. And that's, I mean, for us to fail medications, I'm saying fail medications, it means to try to be treated by that and that not work. That would have taken, I, I estimate, years to, to, to go and up your dose, up your dose, up your dose, be reassessed, up your dose, be, and then add a, another one, add another one. So yes uh, and no, things, things haven't changed. But there's a lot of, of, of work to try and educate and, and change, and a lot of that's coming from Matthew's friends. Again, I keep mentioning them. Cool. Well, let's give a massive round of applause again to Claire for such a... And also, and also just quickly. Sorry, I did just want to thank my husband because we've been a, it's been a lonely journey, but we've been a partnership, every decision, all of that research, all that hard work. I just really want to give a look, like, love and thanks to him.